Welcome, strangers, to this edition of Talkumentary Insider. This is a bonus feature of our regular broadcast called Talkumentary, where we get to pick the brains of the people involved in these wonderful documentaries that we cover. I am here with my friendly ghost of a co-host over there, Mr. Bryce Necker. What's up, Bryce? Hello, hello. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. <laughs> Are you excited about this one this evening? I am very excited about it, yeah. Good, good. Um, one of the, the documentaries that we covered recently on our main show is a film from 2005, or I believe it was released in 2005, chronicling the life of American artist and musician Daniel Johnston. It is called The Devil and Daniel Johnston. If you haven't seen the film, go and see this film and then listen to our main show, documentary covering it. Um, we'd love it if you check those things out before listening to this. Otherwise, settle in for the next, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes or so, and we're going to pick the brain of a very, very special guest for this episode of Insider. He's known for films such as Half Japanese, The Band That Would Be King, The Dude, The Real Rocky, author of the J.T. Leroy story, and of course, he is the director of The Devil and Daniel Johnston. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Fjorzig. Hi, Jeff. Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing very nice well. To nice. nice to meet you as well. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. The, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things for us, you know, we're not, we're, we're we're just under a year old as a podcast and, you know, I'm, I'm going and I'm, I'm reaching out to, to people that I respect and admire. And I'm going, you know, if it, if they reach out back, that's, that's cool. And if they don't, that's cool too. And and so I always get excited when I see that little bubble pop up. I'm like, oh man, this, this is going to be a lot of fun. So we're really excited to have you here. I'm actually going to start off, um, asking Bryce a quick question. Um, oh. Bryce, why don't you start off by talking to both Jeffs here um, and about what this documentary has meant to you and why you advocated so hard to get this onto our show and then why you're so stoked to have Jeff here today. Yeah. Uh, start with you. Starting with me. All right. <laughs> yeah. It only gets better from here. Yep. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I saw The Devil and Daniel Johnston uh, years ago. Um, it was streaming on Prime at the time, and I thought, this looks interesting. And then you, you start a movie thinking you're not going to sit there and watch the whole thing, but I couldn't look away and yeah. just got completely wrapped up in it. And yeah, then I told everyone about it, yep. and some people watched it, and yep. then we just talk about it all the time. <laughs> Yeah, there, and, there's a lot of a lot of quotable moments in the, in that yeah. film, um, and just in the life of Daniel Johnston, I, I would imagine as well. And Jeff, I'm sure you're going to be able to speak a little bit more towards that. Um, so, Jeff, uh, half Japanese, the band that would be king, the devil and Daniel Johnston, the real Rocky, the JT Leroy story. You have some pretty heavy hitters under your belt, man. Um, I'm sure all ins aspiring filmmakers. Want to know, you know, when you, when you, how do you know when you have a subject that's worth putting your heart and soul into with, in a documentary? Like, is this something that you just feel or is, you, you know, you obviously put a lot of time, effort, resources into making this film and all of your films. Is it just passion for a certain thing or is there, I mean, it, what, what is that process like for you? Well, you know, every one of those films are independent films that, you know, an idea sort of popped into my head one day. Mm -hmm. And they're all story based, like story is king. And if I can find a story that I can get inside and then spend a few years going down a rabbit hole inside that story, mm -hmm. that's a film for yep. me. Um, so yeah, Devil and Daniel Johnston was my second feature. Half Japanese, the band that would be king, is my first feature. Right when I was uh, quite young, right out of college, mm -hmm. and that was an indie film that I self financed. Uh, I was a commercial wow director, and um, but I wanted to be an independent filmmaker when I was young. Indie film had sort of um, magically appeared around eighty five here in the here in the states. Uh, we had Jim Jarmusch, Spike Lee. Those were yeah. really powerful. It's a powerful moment. It was like America's new wave. And I was just the right age 
um, to get that. Uh, right. I was doing college radio. I was very much a part of the underground music scene coming out of uh, punk rock, post-punk, yeah. and, yep. and indie, indie music. Um, and that whole DIY mentality mm-hmm. of music scene that I was very much a part of, I I just applied that to film and to documentary at that year. You know, mm-hmm. I started with Jeff in 1990. Wow. So documentary was not a hot thing or, uh, by any stretch of imagination. It was, it was like BBS, eat your vegetables. Uh-huh. <laughs> very, very cool. uh, certainly Hollywood wanted nothing to do with it. Right. And that, that was great. So, uh, you know, for me to get in on the in film scene that I wanted to be part of, for pennies on the dollar, you know, like an indie film that scripted, which I also do. I'm a screenwriter. I'm a WGA screenwriter. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, one of those films ever got made. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that those films cost millions of dollars. And half Jap, I spent probably ninety thousand dollars over three years wow. of my own money from commercial directing fees. I was doing burgers, chickens, right, cars, sneak political candidates. You name it. Yeah, I directed it, and it was a great training ground. But I, I put my money where my mouth is, and I said, I'm going to invest in myself because Hollywood wasn't going to, at that time, and probably never pay for a half Japanese film, that's for sure. Right. So, uh, you know, I just was, I wanted to document the underground. And a lot of my documentary heroes were really from the 60s, Albert Maisel's, Hannah Baker. I love those films. Those are verite films. That was, yeah. That's not exactly what I do. It's fine, but I love them. But nobody... Nobody was doing that. It was very expensive to roll 16 millimeter in 1990. And, and that's what you that's what you did half jap on, right? Yes, that was 16 millimeter. Right. And, um, you know, it got a theatrical in art houses across the United States. Mm-hmm. And that was a big part of it. Like for me, it was like it's I'm very proud of the film. It's not a perfect film by any stretch of the imagination. It's not a home run the way Devil turned out. But it was where I was at that young age and the abilities I had to try to show off my chops, you know, and that's what I did. But it was a story I really wanted to tell. And it's a funny film and I wanted it to be funny. And, um, you know, people liked it and uh, it, it it got shown in, you know, we showed it in film forum in New York. Yeah. Two week run before we opened. That was like a dream come true for me. But what we did in every city, we wanted to make an event. There was local, well, there was, um, you know, the Village Voice. Every city, every cool city had an arts paper back then. That's right. how film would be promoted. And to get ink, you know, you had to do the work yourself. After you make the film, you now got to promote the film and show the film and somehow get an audience. So that's what I was doing. And we would have half Japanese play often in the theater right after the credits roll. So we would oh, make, yeah. and, if, and nobody had done that. That was like Chicago, Toronto, New York, LA. So you're, you're paving the way for a lot of, of a lot of how people are doing uh, at least some screenings for some of these more indie and DIY films. That's pretty sweet, man. Hmm. Well, that's, that's, that was the fun. It was like, let's bring the fun. Let's make it mm-hmm. fun and event for people, for cinema geeks, music freaks, whatever yep. to come out, and have a great evening and blow their minds. And and we did that in every city. But we would get ink in uh, Chicago Reader, LA Weekly, Film Pick of the Week, up against Hollywood movies. They, you know, they did, we were like a sleeper cell. Right. You know, we, we <laughs> knew what we were doing to try to, like, shake up the culture. That's We were just trying to have fun because half Japanese are fun. Right. Um, so that's what I did. And, um, you know, that film is somewhat available if you want to track it down. Yeah. It's actually being shown here in Echo Park next week. People keep inviting that film out, and that's fine. But that's really off of what happened with Devil, which is, of course, what we're going to start talking about. I guess. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can talk about whatever you want. That's just that's what that's what brought you into our purview was, uh, was Bryce bringing the, the the Devil and Daniel Johnson to us. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that, man. Do you, do you feel like uh, when you're making these films? So it has a very um, like you said, DIY sort of underground punk vibe to it, which 
I think you pulled off very nicely. And, you know, both Bryce and I have, have dabbled, you know, this was, uh, you know, early two thousands, you know, when that was like the, the in, initial run of some of these more underground punk and, and, you know, hardcore and all that was, was something that, you know, was, was sort of just making its way to the Midwest, I think, um, where we're from. And, you know, I think I speak for both of us. We were both sort of enthralled with that. And so that's probably why the two of us. So we have a crew of probably like seven people or so that do this show. Um, I'm the main host and these guys kind of, they kind of rotate in and out, but the two of us, I think sort of gripped onto a, 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 a film like the devil and Daniel Johnston, because it really has that sort of underground indie Mm -hmm. feel. And I think that's sort of what a lot of people love about the music scene, like you were speaking to. And I, I just to compliment you, I think you did a wonderful job of, of kind of merging those two things and, and giving that to kids like us in that are, you know, uh, interested in that, I suppose. Um, do you think though, that does every, can, can a, a, can skill in filmmaking make anything interesting or do you have to have uh do you have to have something that you consider to be you know gold before you're going to like start digging into it or at least have an idea of of which direction you're going to go or do you think that you can kind of if you do it right can anything be told. I don't know if that, if I'm, if I'm making sense with that question, I'm just curious about when you, when you dig into stuff, how you kind of choose that material. Well, you know, let's just use devil for an example. So, you know, I was in college radio. Mm -hmm. I was a DJ in the eighties uh, in WTSR Trenton, as well as WPRB Princeton. Okay. And the underground was very, very real. Now it's online somewhere, but Back then, it was on, in fanzines. Uh -huh. And a lot of this music, you know, listen, I listen to all kinds of music. Sure. It's not just punk rock. Neil Johnson's not punk rock. No. So, you know, the point is that he's coming out of a folk tradition in piano and acoustic guitar, and, but it's really singer-songwriter. Right. Anyway, the point is that he started making a splash and a scene in the, in the, in the deep underground, and I heard about it. Mm -hmm. But most important was, well, it was a lot of things that happened. So in 85, when he's... He invents lo-fi. He's taking the cassette recorder, a little Radio Shack thing, and he's right. he's making like six albums in a basement in West Virginia with this cassette recorder. It's crazy. This is a guy who's, you know, not going to an expensive recording studio, not letting get anything get in the way. It's just the songwriting and the playing. Right. And he's prolific, and he's doing all this. And he's releasing this stuff on the cheapest tapes you've ever seen, <laughs> the shittiest you know, clamshells and the yep. glue is and the primitive artwork and mm -hmm. selling them for like three bucks a pop. And, you know, I saw an ad for this, uh, for these tapes in a fanzine um, for from stress records. Right. Like, oh, I got to check that out. So I sent off, you know, my three bucks for probably hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. Which is like, me, you know, it's like the greeting album. <laughs> and then I got them all. But anyway, what was so great, was not only were the, were the songs and this, you know, incredible, interesting voice really captivating my mind because it was about two things. It was about unrequited love, great yep. theme. And he was writing really honestly about his own struggles with his mental illness. Yeah. And it was very, very autobiographical. So you feel, you felt, I felt like I knew this guy, but then he had great humor. So he was recording his mom <laughs> she clearly did, clearly did not know this. He right. yelling it from his basement in yep. West Virginia. And he would put it between the songs on the tapes. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, that, I, that's so cool. I, well, I love this. You know, I love the Scorsese film back then. I still love it. Uh, the mm -hmm. King of Comedy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this guy's just like a real life <laughs> Rupert Pupkin because it's yeah. real, not fictional. And I also really love this great book from New Orleans. A Confederacy of Dunces, John Kennedy Toole, who mm -hmm. committed suicide, wrote this book that won the Pulitzer Prize. And the mm -hmm. character, Ignatius J. Riley, had this incredible relationship with this mom, very similar to Scorsese's King of Comedy. 
So once again, I saw that in Daniel's life. I don't know the guy. Yeah. He's kind of miserable at this point to me. Mm -hmm. And I started keeping a file on him because all of a sudden, he certainly didn't get famous, but he became known in the underground through right. WFMU in New Jersey and Sonic Youth and a few tastemakers on the East Coast. And Yola Tango, definitely. Yeah. In Hoboken. I was living in Hoboken by that, by that time. So that was the big hotbed of the music scene. It was very regional. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I started keeping a folder on him because all of a sudden this guy who I can't see play live, he doesn't tour, he's <laughs> in the metal. Well, in and out, yeah. he's throwing an old lady from church out a window. Right. He's crashed dad's plane. It's just like, holy Christ. I'm just, so I kept his folder. And what I found was his story was epic yeah. in my mind. Yeah. And, but largely unknown, which was great because there's no internet, you know? Yeah. You have, also, you'd have to be, you'd have to be reading those zines and, and, and a part of that scene. And a lot of people that would be interested in this probably aren't reading those things. So, well, certainly the fanzines had a small audience, but you know, yeah. when he would, when he would crash a plane or throw a lady out the window, he was in the village voice, <laughs> yeah. the New York Press, yeah. like real newspaper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was making the news and I just kept following it. I clearly loved his songwriting and his piano playing, his guitar playing. I loved his records, but I loved his myth and story. He had it all in mm -hmm. mind. Um, he, you know, people in the in, uh, the gatekeeper of you know at the time, which sort of been eradicated now. The Rolling Stone magazines and the major music labels and all the people, the gatekeepers of who becomes popular, right? Um, you know, hated this guy and, and the old crusty screen. You know, the, the old crusty music writers from the sixties who just can't stop writing. I love Bob Dylan. There's no bigger fan. The Beach sure. Boys. I mean, I, no, there's no bigger fan. But enough already. It's like it's <laughs> two thousand. It's already. It was two thousand. We started making that film. Like mm -hmm. enough. There's got to be somebody new, mm -hmm. younger who is new, truly the new Dylan. That, but you know, in a different way. And yep. I felt it was da it was Daniel. Yeah. Um. So once again, to answer your question, you know, story is everything. If you're a filmmaker, documentary filmmakers, nonfiction filmmakers, listening, it's like. You're wasting your time going to film school. You can learn camera, learn editing, mm -hmm. learn sound recording. Uh, you know, you can do that. Yeah. But you should go to story. You go to story school, man. You got to read books. You got to. Yeah. You got to study story. You got to read articles. You got to understand storytelling. Right. And then, you know, anyone can make a great shot. Sure. Anybody can record sound editing. You got to like take those ideas from novels and all kinds of places and yep. make something unique and interesting. And that's kind of where my head was at. Well, especially, you know, and you're doing that before YouTube's a thing and you're doing that before it's, you know, any, any more, like the important part is not how do I learn how to make a film? Because yeah, although that's important and you're up against, you know, a slew of independent filmmakers that even more so now where you've got the internet and, and you've got YouTube out there, but you're, you're also able to learn how to do those things. I I mean, our little setup down here, which is nothing to speak of, but it's all learned from just YouTube, <laughs> you know, and just like, well, how do I set this thing up? Okay. Well, it, it tells you, but you didn't have access to that. So you're kind of more trial and error at that point in time. But today you, you can't, although you could get on and find like a, a class or like some sort of a, a discussion about, um, you know, storytelling, but you've got to, you've got to really work on that piece. Um, so yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that answer a lot. Um, this film, so, so you, when you made this film, you were, you had already, from what it sounds like, what you just said was you had already kind of heard some of the big stories that were documented here right so you know the the plane crash and the lady out the window and all that had already happened when you started making this so you have to go in after the fact and basically ask everyone to relive these things um tell them you know direct them how to tell this story and you know and and make it into a a feature film the way that you did or a, a film that you that you did clearly 
so so you're dealing with uh, a subject that has been struggling a lot with mental health, right? In in a time where mental health wasn't as touted and as you know uh, spoken about as it is maybe now. So there had to be, I would imagine, I don't mean to speak for you, but I would imagine there had to be some struggles because you work directly with Daniel for this film, right? And, and just by yeah. the videos that you put into this film and the, and the interactions with people with Daniel himself, you know, did you find, was that kind of challenging at times? I, I would imagine. Well, the whole thing was challenging because, sure. you know, the, the the key the key to telling that story, which was a true story and needed to be told, was I had deep empathy for mm -hmm. his struggles with mental health. Um, it's not exploitive in any way. I, I no. just I, it's, it's a horrible story, and what his family and friends went through because of it mm -hmm. was a big theme of the film. I mean, that's why it's the devil and Daniel Johnson. Devil is a metaphor for his mental health is yep. also the devil because he's is from a right-wing christian family church of christ mm -hmm. the devil is very real to this him and his family so that you know to me it's a metaphor maybe it's not to him right. but it is if anyone's watching the film i think it comes through pretty clearly that that's what i was doing yep um but yeah it was very difficult because i you know daniel as as you learn through the people who were even closer to him than me i mean though i spent some years with the man and we were friends Mm -hmm. Nobody gets that close to Daniel. I mean, in his own headspace, he thinks he's you know, he, right? He's he's a pain in the ass, <laughs> and everybody that he's a really difficult person. Yeah, but he also he's brilliant. He's yeah. the hardest person in the room at all times. Mm -hmm. But he also is a self saboteur, mm. and that's just how it goes. I mean, you know, like uh, what Herzog said, you know, as Nonfiction documentary filmmakers, when we go into a place, in this case, Waller, his family, and mm -hmm. the subject, or whether you're going to um, a location somewhere in South America or Africa or wherever to get a story, yeah, you know, we're thieves. We're stealing this stuff so we can somehow find a truth. Now, what Herzog calls it, which I really agree with, is is the ecstatic truth that's larger than the truth like right. that's what i think is what we're really going for here and i was just on this trip i yes i knew the story like the back of my hand mm -hmm. and i wrote a screenplay to figure out the three acts of what it would be but it it's still told by all these real people right and you know that's the challenge and that's the fun it's like fun is really what it is more than the challenge it's yeah both. but this is the sandbox i play in and that's a, and that's what I'm really happy. And I spent four and a half years in that sandbox. Yeah, and it, it like it's a meticulously made, handmade film made out of largely a lot of, you know, at the time you wouldn't see, you know, Super Eight and crappy home videos. Right. I, I didn't shoot that stuff, but I got it from everyone all over the world that filmed Daniel. He was so interesting; people would point cameras at him. Yeah. Plus, he's he's self documenting and taping himself all the time. That's like a so gold mine. Sorry? That's like a I'm gold sorry. mine. You you like you have so much stuff to work with. And you know, I, I feel like, you know, that that was another question that I had for you is when when you're dealing with someone that's self document and I I'm sorry if I cut you off. Well, um and you know, you've got someone who's got what I would only imagine is mountains of of cassette tapes and you know, drawings and uh and, you know, both of him just speaking and him singing music or he, him playing piano or whatever it may be, that had to be an arduous task to try to go through all that. I mean, hopefully you had a team to kind of help you. Maybe did, did no, just you. No. And, no, and I, it was, it's me making the film with my producer, Henry Rosenthal mm -hmm. and my editor. And I'm responsible back then, you know, we couldn't do digital transcriptions, which I do now in my new films. Uh huh. Uh, which, you know, only helps a little bit. Yep. What I would do is sit there with headphones and transcribe everything myself personally. Oh, my gosh. And if I found something that I thought was had big merit, I would use the star system. I was like, oh, that's a five-star bit. Oh, mm -hmm. that's three stars. Oh, that's no good. And I would figure out how I was going to work the film. That's why 
the film has this internal monologue with those cassette tapes. Yeah. That to me, finding that material. Are the images? Yeah, it, was a, it was a mountain of stuff. It was the largest archive, to my knowledge at the time, ever found on a subject like this. Wow. It was, it was multimedia. I mean, you can't imagine thousands of photos. I mean, right. Super 8 movies. We didn't know he made Super 8 films, but those films are hugely important in the creation of this film. Yeah. So I would, I would re-edit his Super 8, which, of course, were silent films i would make mm -hmm. new films out of them largely you know and just yeah. re-edit them on theme or whatever i was doing yeah. um that's a flip books game animation i mean it, it, this guy had we didn't know he had all this stuff you know yeah. i knew about some of it but certainly i didn't know we found a box a shoe box of super eight millimeter home movies which once again, not there was home movies like yeah. family stuff, yep. which are great, and I use them. But more important, he made films. This guy, comedy films, yeah, and they were brilliantly directed. And he's acting in the films. He's like Peter Sellers, yeah. He's acting as himself and his mom in drag. So and he's good. He's, and the guy's a mastermind. So he was a great filmmaker too. I love so that, that part of the film. Was, where he find that stuff was like, and it was, it was being. It looks like snowflakes. Uh huh. It's because it was being eaten by mold from a oh, damn wow. Cloud. We rescued this stuff. And the same thing that went on with the with a lot of the art and the cassettes, they were in hefty bags underneath the lawnmower and the oil cans in the garage. Oh, they were my ready God. To be the family didn't know at the time how valuable this stuff is. Now it's in museums. Right. I'm not mm -hmm. making it up. I mean, it really is. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, nobody – Nobody was interested in Dan. No one took him seriously. Nobody thought he was a great artist or a great musician. Back then. Right. No. To, to them, maybe he was just this weirdo who, you know, but you're like, no, that's not, that's not weird. Well, I mean, some people may consider that a little bit strange, but you know, that's, that's somebody who's dealing with their own devils, uh, no pun intended, and who has found a creative way to let those things out and uh, to you know, communicate those to himself and to the world and to his family. And, and, you know, that to me, you know, the, the wild conflict in this film that was so compelling to me was the story of a genius, right? Whose main antagonist or villain was his own brain and inside his own head. So it was causing him a lot of problems, but to the, the, the conflict there is that we saw in this film was to stifle that villain, quote unquote, with medicine or whatever it may be, it actually would stifle Daniel's art as well. So capturing that, you you did that so well, you know, to to capture his lows. It, it's such a it's such a dynamic piece because his lows were also his artistic highs, you know, and. Awesome. Yeah. At least, at least that's the the way I perceived it, and mm -hmm. you know, so it. I think that's why it was so interesting to me because when you talk about the hero's journey and the the you know the the what a you know if you were to to tell AI to create you know a perfect story, it's chances are it's going to follow the the normal tropes and the normal um, you know hero's journey kind of thing where you find you know. Uh, the un the unsuspecting hero find you know and then there's conflict and then there's the the mentor and all this and this kind of follows that but the villain isn't an external villain it's an internal one which is also in my opinion anyway it also served as his superpower <laughs> the villain and the superpower are almost the same thing it's an illness, right? It's a it's a something he's struggling with, but it also is fueling or aiding some of the the most incredible art that we've seen, you know. So I I just thought I, I don't know if there's any question there or anything that you guys want to <laughs> add. It's just more me me giving my you know outlook on on that piece. Um, yeah. Well, I'll make a I'll give one comment. Sure about what we were addressing a little bit earlier in fairness to the family. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes through clearly in the film, though they didn't understand this crazy art and music, this their, their son was making their very troubled son. They did appreciate that 
when fan letters would come in all over the world, they saved them all. They understood that people like myself and the underground all over the world did appreciate it. They did get that. And they were super supportive that he continued to make that art and get it and bring him supplies and, and let him to do what he did. He obviously can't hold a day job, this guy, except right. for that one time at McDonald's. McDonald's, he's yeah. McDonald's, you know, he's McDonald's most famous employee. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact is they've come, they did come around eventually once the film came out and now they finally understand his place in the world and the world didn't understand his place in the world at the time either. Right. But now they do. Now, now he's considered, you know, right. The way we me and a few people thought about him as truly one of the great, certainly the greatest of his generation. Absolutely. A long shot. Um, but I'm sorry, you were, the other thing you were just discussing that I thought was interesting um, I was talking about I, the the villain uh, in his own mind. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, it's it's class. It's, you got to know the rules before you break the rules. That's sure. just how it is with story. So I, I like that you brought up Hero's Journey. I'm certainly not against it. Mm -hmm. But documentaries, classically and typically back then, mm -hmm. definitely did not adhere to no. a classic three act structure. Right. Um, and I impose that as a challenge to myself to see if I could do that. And it was interesting for me. It was not instantaneous. It was a lot of work to get it right. Yeah. So. Um, and you've got to you have know. a pretty dynamic story to even consider being able to do that. Cause you're, like you said, you're not doing the, the PBS after school documentary here. You're wanting something that can, it, it's not just roll, roll the TV into the classroom and put it in front of the, the kids so they can learn, you know, how bees procreate or whatever there you're, you're wanting to show a documentary for that, that shows not just this was what the life of this person was like. You're like, no, let's tell the story of that, you know, a compelling story. So yeah, I, I think that's, you got to well, You, you started know, it in the right place. So. So, many, so many classic conflicts. Man versus nature, man against himself, which is basically what this is. It's mm -hmm. just that the devil is larger than the self because right. it's it's an actual invisible antagonist. Yeah. And when I discovered that, I think the film really came together. The themes are all there staring me in the face. Yeah. But when I finally got that title and identified my antagonist, because I didn't know it initially, it was there in the material that I filmed and that I found from the archive, but I didn't. You know, I'm not I'm not omniscient by any stretch. It's just hard to figure and crack crack that story. So, um, the film actually does uh, conform to a class three act structure. It's got a unique cold opening, which I from Raging Bull. Mm -hmm. um, out of that, all my films do that. I don't do a, I don't do a montage of fame. Which, you know, very much offends me. Uh, there are a lot of talking heads in the film. But it's a biographical film, and there's no one else to tell those stories. Right? Um, people are sick of talking heads because they you, you see these documentaries now, and then people think if you just shoot some talking heads and get some archive and <laughs> whack it together, you made a documentary. Right. But you know what? That's not how it works. Story is at least what I'm doing: three acts, and it's supposed to be satisfying. And I'm basically fooling you that it it can be entertaining, or as funny, or as moving, or as tragic as a good. Hollywood movie. Right. So that's, that was my goal. So, I was, you know, but you can get a lot of story and move real fast in, in nonfiction that you can't with dialogue in a classic Hollywood screenplay. Sure. Yeah. So this film covers a lot of ground and it moves real fast. So that was fun for me. I just realized that I never clicked record on the, uh, Zencaster, but, but we already had, um, We've got it recording on my end, so it's no big deal. I've got it all. I'll, but leave, it. I'll leave it to you. No, nope, we're we're all right. We're good. I've got it all on. We'll edit. Yep. 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 Can you just go back and uh, yeah, can you repeat all that? My other, my other comment I'd like to make about story structure, because you yep. brought it up. Yeah, please. And here, Journey was, you know, I interviewed Daniel for about five days. Super 16 millimeter, this film is very expensive. Mm-hmm. He couldn't tell, you know, by the time I met him, he couldn't tell his own stories. He, mm. he just, he wasn't there. So I threw all that in the garbage and that was that. But what was so cool is it forced me to do something unique that I probably wouldn't have figured out. 
So you have to make a, a problem into a solution. Right. So when I found those those audio diaries, I like to call them the cassettes, right? Mm -hmm. That became an internal monologue. Like I love Woody Allen's film Zelig, and there's a therapy session that the, he, he keeps coming back to. And when he's in therapy, you're getting what's in his mind and what's really going on. And then you cut away to all the Zelig stuff. And I love that film. So I basically stole that. And <laughs> no one knows that. But basically, those tapes are internal monologue, which I love. Yeah. And it it's a parallel edit situation off of the stories being told by the friends and family. Wow. So th I think that's what made the film truly unique and better and more emotional and deep. And you don't feel like you're missing Daniel. But the fact is, he's not interviewed in this film. Right. You know, which is great. I love it. People are like, why didn't Daniel get interviewed in your in your film? <laughs> and I'm like, well, he 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 did, but it, you know, you don't use it because it was horrible and you wouldn't be watching the film right now if right. I made a film on Daniel's interviews. So that's that, you know. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. You got something, Bryce? Yeah. All right. Um, so as you're going through all of this footage and all this audio and everything, um, and I'm asking this story how did you decide the opening scene or how well, to start the story right there? I thought it was pretty cool. I, I, you know what I didn't know was the opening when I shot it, but it's black and white. It shot exactly like Penna Baker and shooting Dylan. Don't look back on purpose. Mm, okay. We're in a theater in LA. Daniel's doing an acoustic concert. It's two cameras, me on one super 16, my DP fortune Procopio on the other. It's blocked out. And we're going to cover these songs. Great. But most important is that this guy, John Pokna from the art gallery did a, did a, an intro of him. And he, he's, he, when he brings Daniel on stage, he says, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest singer songwriter alive today, <laughs> Daniel Johnston. Now I thought that was awesome. And, uh -huh. I, and he believed it. It's not hyperbole. Yeah. <laughs> and I believed it. I know that, you know, a lot of people are ripping their hair out out of the gate, but I'm doing, I'm pushing buttons out, out of the gate. Mm. I, I love taking these people who don't believe this, these haters who, who you know, they, uh, who knows who they liked in 1990. Right. You know, whatever. Well, it doesn't matter. We're not talking about them now. And nobody made a film about them, right? <laughs> it's just a, are ephemeral moments. But yep. it was like, we're, 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 put, we're laying down the gauntlet. This is a fight. And we're going to back this up for the next hour and 50 minutes. Yep. And we're going to prove that statement, whether you like it or not. So it's like provocative. So I love that. That's the cold open. It's really I think cool. he's doing a song called Silly Love. He's tragic, playing it, singing in that voice. Mm -hmm. We have titles, and, you know, off and running. Yeah. You know, we start that film with super, with slides of his babyhood, and his mom, and whatever. Yep. And we're off, we're, we're off and running. We got to tell this story. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and and clearly Bryce and I aren't the only ones who think that that this was a, a wonderful documentary. Um, you know, Rotten Tomatoes gave gave the film a score of eighty eight percent on the tomato meter and a ninety one percent audience score. So when we do this show, it's pretty rare that the audience score is higher than the critic score. Um, I mean, sometimes it happens, but. Um, I love seeing that because that just that if that doesn't point to the underground DIY scene, you know, when the audience loves it more than the critics do, uh, you know, I don't think anything else does. Um, IndieWire touted this film as the number one best music documentary of the 21st century, which is fucking awesome. I mean, this beats out big names like Amy Winehouse, Metallica, Kurt Cobain, uh, even Anvil's documentary, which we covered on our show. Um, yeah. came in number three. So I was super stoked. I'm going, all right, we got two, <laughs> we got two of the top three, uh, in, in our show, which is, which is great. Um, you know, timeout rated this film number nine on the 20th, 20 best music documentaries of all time, which can we just say, uh, how fitting it is that this film came in number nine on their, mm. on their, you know, number nine, number nine, number yeah. nine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just thought that was, you know, I, I wonder if somebody knew and they did that on purpose, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, and then you won, correct me if I'm wrong, the the Documentary Directing Award at Sundance in 2005. So congratulations uh, post, post uh, uh, you know, however many years later. Um, 
but well, well, well deserved, well deserved. Um, I hope you're proud of this. You sound like you are. Uh, it was a beautiful tale of a beautiful man who was seriously struggling in a lot of ways. Um, so I do, I do hope that this is something that you uh, are are proud of. Do you think that? Oh, I mean, I'm incredibly proud of this film. This is good. This film is is basically. Uh, though I got to make other films and I'm making them right now. Yeah. That film is my life, my life's work. I mean, I'm not making mm -hmm. that up. I, that I film was everything. I love that, man. I think that's really cool. I, I put everything. So it's four and a half years. Yeah. To make it. Mm -hmm. It's made independently. Nobody would pay for this film. So that film is a, a in 2000 to 2005, a million dollars on Daniel Johnson. People wow. were mocking us for doing this and laughing at us. And my, my pal, the producer, Henry Rosenthal, he paid for that film because he saw half Japanese. Mm -hmm. And we made the film together, just two pals. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, it's like, it's like going to Vegas and putting all your money on <laughs> red or black. Yeah. And it paid it off. It was a huge, gamble, huge gamble. Yeah. So we went to Sundance. Well, first of all, we got into Sundance, which was great. Yeah. You don't know you're going to win Sundance. That was great. Thank God. And then because <laughs> it won, it was a, you know, we got distribution, big distribution, theatrical, yeah, with, for Sony Pictures Classics, yeah. And now we sell this film all over the world. Um, but these, you know, it, it, that was 2005. It's 2023 now, and these mm -hmm. those lists that you just called out were like two weeks ago. Yeah. So the fact that it's, this just keeps happening. This film has a life of its own outside of me. Um, and the fact that young audiences mm -hmm. and just audiences just keep talking about it and passing it on and discovering it. Yep, I'm I'm, thr I'm thrilled. I mean, well, you know, that, it, that's it, just a test. Launched my, my career. Yeah, <laughs> um, in a big in a big way. Yeah, and that's so, just a testament, uh, I think, of to make more films. You know, yeah, I, I think that's a testament of of cult fandom, um, of the underground, like we've been talking about this whole time. I, I think that's just a true testament of what you know. When when you find something, it's like it's a diamond in the rough. When you when you find something and you can display it in a way that's so respectful and so you know uh, thoughtful in the way that that you did, and people people see that people feel the passion in this. People see uh, you know Daniel and they see his um, his struggles, and they they you feel for him. You root for him. You also shake your head at him uh, during this film, and and you know, especially with the rise of, uh, I guess, it's probably not the rise of, but the rise of awareness in the mental health community. You know, I have a a bachelor's degree in psychology, so I have interest in this. So when I'm watching things like this, you know, I I'm really interested in what he was going through. Do you think that when when Daniel was kind of at, uh, so arguably he may be at the, his peak of fame right now, but um, as far as when he was at his peak of like playing music and be getting into the, the shows and having all that stuff, do you think that the general public had any idea how bad he was struggling with things or did, did they just think that he was a, a quirky and fun, uh, you know, musician do you do you have any th thoughts on that you think they understood well, you gotta remember when we're, when we're making the film there's no general public hmm. it's literally a very small community of geeks and freaks around the world in the underground i mean yeah. you know, it's just not any stretch of the imagination sure on its radar you just don't care hmm. and that's fine they probably never heard it and that's fine that's just not what this was um the underground was always in opposition to the commercial interests right. of the mainstream. So like, you know, in the film, for instance, I'll give you an example. You know, I come out of the underground, you know, I don't use the word alternative. I right. hate that term. <laughs> um, I come out of punk rock and underground and independence. And when, when Nirvana shows up, which is in the film, of course, and mm -hmm. Kurt Cobain, you know, it doesn't matter what I think of Kurt Cobain and his music. He's very talented. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But he's the one who loved half Japanese, loved Daniel Johnson. And he would put it in his diaries and talk about him. And mm -hmm. he wore that T-shirt. And he's the one because he literally changed the whole scene for better or worse. 
he's the one who put Daniel on the map. Then there was a bidding war in the mental hospital, and he gets right. signed to actually a major label record, uh, Atlantic Records, right. which was you know, insane, right? Because he's in his garage and he can't record, and you know he can't be in a studio, and blah blah mm -hmm. blah. And they made this record. It's called Fun. I don't love that record by any stretch. Yeah, and it didn't do very well. Yeah, that's the end. Of, that's the end of Act Two because mm -hmm. it sold like you know. 2000 copies no one no mm -hmm. one wanted that record because he didn't he was not a major label artist mm -hmm. so it was kind of like the audience was not ready at the time mm -hmm. to squint their ears past the hiss on the tapes and hear the genius of the songwriting and the themes right he needed his context which is what my job was he needed that story told to understand what he's doing to then hopefully right. if you spend time with like dylan or something like a, with the great artist and really listen to the songs, you're going to get a big reward. But it's it's not something you just like click and hear a song or two. Mm -hmm. uh, it, like any great artist, I don't care who it is, Velvet Underground. Yep. It's a deep, deep well. And if you go on the deep dive, that's where the rewards come as an audience, as a listener. And that's that's what I do. I, you know, right. Everybody nowadays, unfortunately, has Wikipedia knowledge. They know a little bit about everything. But yep. you know what? I, don't, I know a lot about a couple things. Mm. And one of the things I do a lot about was Daniel Johnston. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. And and you so you said it took about 4 years to make this film. Did you did you get pretty close? Like you you mentioned earlier you you don't nobody really gets that close to Daniel Johnston. Um did did, did you consider did he consider you uh do you consider him to have been one of your friends? Is that a is it, did you guys get close enough that that was a a uh you know, did you guys have a pretty close relationship, you know, all things considered? We were friends. I yeah. mean, we became friends. Like, uh, you know, what I learned quickly was that everyone who was a fan of Daniel, when they met him initially, you know, you think he's Casper the Friendly Ghost. Mm -hmm. He wrote that song. He wrote like four songs about Casper. Mm -hmm. Casper the Holy Ghost. I know Casper personally. You know, Casper's a big theme for him. You know, right. like the white ghost, the white knight that's mm -hmm. going to save the world from Satan. And um, you want to hug Casper and give him a hug, but Casper doesn't know, really hug you back. Right. But what was cool for me was spending, I spent, I mean, my God, huge amounts of time with Daniel. We were living in his town with his family for months on end, right. filming all that. Hey, was that he is the ultimate music geek obsessive, like on things that he loves or King, like he's an expert on mm -hmm. the film King Kong and the cinema of it. Mm -hmm. He's an expert on the Beatles, like to a level you can't imagine. You know, he's this guy, owns every Beatles album in triplicate. He owns every Beatles solo album. He owns every Beatles bootleg album. Wow. And he knows about, he loves the Ruddles. He loves everything. Yeah. Like me, there's certain acts I don't love. Mm -hmm. And most of my music geek friends are that way. We don't love everything. Not Daniel. He's got no filters. He loves everything, this guy. <laughs> he's not going to tell you like journey sucks or whatever or right. kansas or whatever it's not, he's not gonna do that not daniel yeah. daniel loves everything mm -hmm. so he's got a whole <laughs> side to him so we, you know we would hang out and have great conversations you know about yeah. king kong or the beatles or things that he's really you know world war ii yeah or the stuff that he's an expert on right. but then you know he, he would drink you know he had diabetes so he would drink so much sugar you can't imagine they would the family would lock the cabinet up with locks and chains to keep them out of the sugar, but right. we'd find it anyway. But we would go to this Mexican restaurant. He'd order this giant tea, and we'd be having a great conversation with the crew and just bullshitting at the table. And then all of a sudden, Daniel would take the entire diner sugar dispenser, unscrew the silver top, pour the entire oh my sugar God. into this giant tea and he would gulp it and then <laughs> oh the sugar would happen and then boom his head would hit the table and he'd be conked out oh. for the rest of the meal and then 20 minutes later whoop, he wakes up and we have the conversation again wow so yeah it was, it was very difficult to work with him but he was very generous he wanted to record you know whenever we wanted to do songs he would love to do that yeah or make art he would love to do that he just couldn't be interviewed you know right as yeah. we, we already addressed that Yep. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one thing I like about the film is that um, it matches the same kind of energy as Daniel's songs, 
where his songs are just very raw and like, mm-hmm. here it is, here's what I'm feeling. I feel like you get the sense of that in the, in the movie, like you're there, you're one of these characters beside Daniel watching him do all these things. Yeah. Um, so it feels like you're, you're very close into what Daniel's doing and yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I agree. Probably largely due to how much, self-documentation carries the film. I would imagine that's why you're getting that feeling. Yeah. Did, so that's, were that's the, cool. were the, uh, were the cassette tapes that we, so you like zoomed in on the cassette tapes, were those the actual cassette tapes? Oh yeah. The, the little drawings on them and everything and hi Daniel and, and all that, that was all the oh, actual, yeah. uh, so cool. everything's actual, everything's real. I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, you got, you got something else, Bryce or, or, um, yeah. Uh, so your first film was half Japanese. Um, and then, uh, Jad worked with Daniel on it's spooky, uh, which they recorded in a week. Um, which is part of the devil, Daniel Johnson. Yeah. So yeah. Uh-huh. Which is in- yeah. Now, um, I guess in half Japanese, by the way, this is important in half Japanese. Jad covers a Daniel Johnson song, oh. tears, stupid tears. So Daniel's in that film with his music. And then later, of course, I bring Jad and David Fair, right. half Japanese, mm-hmm. as like a recurring character because I love those guys and they're so funny mm, yeah. um, into the devil and Daniel Johnson because they're very much a part of the story in the movie of Daniel. There's no doubt about that. They needed to be in the film. Yeah. And, um, and they're great. Those guys are great. Yeah. No, I, and I think it was so cool in the movie when they were working together. Um, it's like, who's the lead man in this? <laughs> right. Yeah. But... It, that is really cool. Are you think, talking about the movie that they're making, uh, My Dinner with Daniel, or are you talking about the music? Uh, well, I think I think Daniel was the lead man in the movie, for sure. I think he kind of uh, took took care of well, that. He, well, he, he hijacked the movie. They were making a, an indie film like My Dinner with Andre, these yeah. guys, with a, a very lo-fi early video recorder. And then Daniel took over, because as we learned earlier when he was young, Daniel was, of course, a great filmmaker director in the super eights mm-hmm. so all of a sudden this new technology hits david fair shows up with a video camera they're making this film and then in, in the film in, in, in the devil Daniel johnson mm-hmm. daniel hijacks and starts directing yeah. which is awesome you know because that's <laughs> daniel you know he's not you know Dan, daniel has to direct he's always in charge right right so yeah. i think that's a great scene in the film it obviously uh, has a tragic ending we won't ruin it for your uh, podcast listeners but it starts off kind of great, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, sadly, uh, Daniel Johnson did die on September 11th in 2019, uh, at his home in Waller, Texas, where he was living at the end of this documentary. Were, were his, are his parents still around? Did he outlast his parents? I didn't find that anywhere. Do we know? Um, I think is no, I know. Of course I know. Yeah. So yeah. what happened was they were obviously, as you can see in the film, even when I filmed them really old elderly, yeah. uh, Yep. He was the baby in the family. He had a lot of brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe the mom passed first. Okay. Um, and then the dad passed. So Daniel, I did. Daniel did end up outliving them, which okay. was not unexpected. Right? No, no. Uh, and then his brother, uh, you know, basically became his caretaker and manager. Okay. And he still he still manages and deals with the Daniel Johnston estate and music and art. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, so I read a clip from the Austin American Statesman about Daniel's funeral. Uh, were you able to be there? I'm just curious. I was not at the funeral. My, my friends were there yeah. who were part of the film. I wasn't able to be there. I, I actually went – I'm not big on funerals. So I yeah, did honor is, Daniel in a big, yeah. big way. Mm-hmm. I actually went to Austin the night after he died. They did. I went to San Francisco and Austin, two flights. Mm-hmm. We showed the devil and Daniel Johnson to the fans who were mourning. Oh, and do Q and A, and that was the way me and my my pal Henry Rosenthal, the producer, wanted to honor Dan. And um, oh, that's really that cool. Did. That's really cool. Um, I did read that there was about a hundred uh, mourners there, including uh, David Thornberry, Kathy McCarthy, uh, Brian Beatty, Beatty um, and Jeff Tar- uh, Tartikoff, and uh, and. Uh, they spoke of the theme of love and hope that runs through all of Daniel's music, which, you know, to, to boil down 
to the best of, you know, I'm not an expert by any means, but to kind of boil down what, what I got from Daniel's music and his message, it was all about love and hope. I mean, every song almost that, that you showed on, on this documentary was about love in one way or another. Um, th- maybe not every one of them, but, but that was the, the ongoing theme that, I, that I picked up on and, you know, and hope. So yeah, he deals with his devils, the devil, but you know, he had so much hope and, you know, a lot of these musicians at his funeral did actually play covers of his songs, uh, at, at one of the, at the reception. Um, what, I, this might not be a fair question, but what do you feel like is one of, if not the most memorable thing that you take with you from the film, the four filming years of this film and the people that were involved in your relationship with Daniel and everything? Is there something that stands out as like, and maybe again, maybe it's not a fair question. And, and if you don't, have an answer to it, that's okay. But is there something that stands out to you as being one of, if not the most memorable parts of it for you? Yeah, there, there actually is. Okay, good. Um, you know, we, we basically spent four years together, four and a half years making the thing, but in, you know, back and forth to Texas Yeah. and I was living in LA and, you know, different junkets, different trips. I would edit and shoot, edit, shoot. That's how I work. Mm-hmm. But toward the end of the shoot, see Daniel, stays up every night in that garage that you see in the film in Waller. I mean, that's his studio. It's a garage mm-hmm. turned into a art music studio. He sleeps all day. So, you know, he would stay up like he's drawing and writing songs every single night. Nobody worked harder. Nobody wow. made more art than this guy. So I would be in this garage with him in my Bolex, my super 60 millimeter Bolex, mm-hmm. you know, after the crew had wrapped and he'd be spinning the ruddles. Now, mm-hmm. I never really appreciated the Ruddles the way he did. But when I heard it through Daniel, I was like, man, yeah, the Ruddles really are as great as the Beatles. So anyway, so yeah. one night he's spinning the Ruddles and I was filming, you know, all the little smiley faces and monsters and Draculas and Frankensteins and uh-huh. all the stuff. That, that, that garage is just filled with this stuff and he knows where every little thing is. So I was just filming it. It's like three in the morning and he's playing uh, Ruddles. It's fantastic. There's a song called Number One. You know, it sounds like the Beatles. Mm-hmm. And then Daniel got up and I decided to film him, just me and Daniel in my Bolex. It's the very last scene of the film. It's the title sequence at the end. Mm. And Daniel does an interpretive dance of his entire life. Wow. And as I'm filming at three in the morning, alone in this garage, the beat, the Ruddles blasting and Daniel's doing these different dances. He's doing... Mm. The, the helicopter dance, like the plane crash. Yep. He's doing the Jackie Gleason for his comedy. Yep. He's doing kind of the, the devil dance. He's doing all these different interpretive yeah. dances. And I'm yelling at him, like, go, deal, go, go, go. Well, I got my Bolex. It's all mm-hmm. silent. And that I knew when I was filming it, like I'm in the eyepiece with Daniel, like out of the whole four years, I was like, this is the greatest piece of film I've ever shot. I knew it. I walked out of that wow. garage. 3.30 in the morning and Henry was there. And I was like, that was the greatest thing I will ever film. Nothing will ever be better. Every, it was his gift. Yeah. And, he, 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 and it ended up in, you know, when I edited it, edited it together for that sequence at the end, it's like, it just knocks you on your ass. It's like a summation of the entire movie in like a minute and a half. Yeah. And, and to this day, like, you know, I love a lot of the stuff I keep shooting but man, I'm not sure I'm ever going to have a better night on earth with a camera. Well, what a Make what a powerful batteries. way to Yeah, what a powerful way to wrap up your your film too. I mean, the credits rolling and him dancing as Casper, that's beautiful. But there's just so much emotion in the scene you just talked about. I it kind of gives me goosebumps when you're talking about it because when you're talking about it, I'm remembering in my head watching the film and seeing that and seeing, you know, just exactly what you're saying. He's showing his frustrations, you know, he's kind of holding his hands at his side and they're, they're shaking and vibrating. And he holds that for like what felt like forever, you know, I'm going, man, there, and then he's spinning around and dancing to where he, you know, feeling maybe freedom or something. And like 
to to have been there, I can only imagine that it's really meaningful to me that that was your memorable part. So, so thank you for sharing that. Um, do you have anything else going on right now that you want to plug or speak about before we get, let you kind of get on with your evening? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I'm in production on a, on a new feature documentary. It's a music story. It's not announced in the trades right now because I'm not allowed to announce it, but I'm very okay. much in production. I just got back from a bunch of shoots in the UK. I'm really? super excited about it. I love the story, Good. but I can't say what it is yet. Okay. But I'm excited. I'm excited for you guys to see it when it's done. Absolutely. Um, I'm working really hard on it. I'm having a great time. I love the story. So that's what I'm doing. And hopefully it'll be, you know, a different film because I'm trying to make all these films you know, to be as unique as possible from the previous films. So very cool. Hey, uh, Bryce, do you have anything before we move on to the kind of the tail end of the show? Um, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll, keep, we'll keep going. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Jeff, um, I wonder if you would be interested in uh, a short little game before we go. We've, we've started. So, um, and it's okay if you don't want to do it. No, no harm at all but so bryce and i every pretty much every week we go to play pub trivia okay um we've started putting a little secret segment at the end of each of our episodes where we uh do a few trivia questions about the uh content and obviously you you're gonna have a much uh a, a hand up on this one uh probably because of your your expertise so three questions just for fun it'll go at the end of the the episode um if you're willing I'm willing. All I'm, right. I don't know how well to do, but let's let's give it a whirl. All right. So I put together just a couple questions. Um, nothing with too much deep diving research or anything like that. So maybe you're going to tell me actually, Jeff, you're wrong, <laughs> and uh, this is this is the truth. But all right. According to Daniel's wiki page, how many studio albums has Daniel released? Studio. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Uh, studio albums? Yeah. First of all, it's a gray area because Okay, I wondered. To me, all the cassettes are still studio albums. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it, it, it'd be very tough to put a number on that at this point. Um and that's that. Yeah. Also, you know, I, I don't make any bones about this. Yeah. His early his early cassette albums are the best of his work. For sure. The nineteen the nineteen ninety album, which is largely the soundtrack of the film and where songs like true love will find you in the end came from something's us a long time. Mm -hmm. Those that's from the 1990 album produced by my friend Kramer. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, Daniel isn't writing songs to the level that I loved for a lot of other albums that he continued making albums. Right. And I'm the biggest Daniel Jonathan. It doesn't mean I love everything he did. Sure. But you know, most of it's like, you know, basically fall off a cliff. Uh -huh. Daniel's not a he kept creating, yep. but the, the songs went down. Like Artistic Vice has a couple great songs, yeah. And then the other albums, I'm not that I'm not as interested in them. Sure, just to be you know, to be honest. The you but I couldn't the newer ones. Right? You mean like the the stuff from like 2001 to 2012? Is that what you mean? That you're yeah. not as in, yeah. I mean, they're they're not bad. It's just they're not right. It's not classic Coke, you know. Yeah. Yep. And those are you know if if you go for your listeners, if you really want to go on the trip. Mm -hmm. The real trip, you got to go to Songs of Pain, yep. More Songs of Pain, Hi, yep. How Are You, Yip Jump Music, um, Respect, yep. uh, The What of Whom, uh, Live at South by Southwest, all the stress cassettes. That's uh -huh. where you want to go. And then into 1990, that's the trip. Okay. So Wikipedia does say that there's 21 albums which start with Songs of Pain and go all the way through Space Ducks. So um, maybe that's that's closer to reality than um, maybe studio albums probably isn't a, a good good word. But yeah, Songs of Pain, Don't Be Scared, uh, The What of Whom, More Songs of Pain, Yip Jump Music, Hi, How Are You, Retired Boxer, Respect, Continue Stories, Continued Story with Texas Instruments, Merry Christmas, it's spooky with Jad Fair, uh, 1990 artistic vice fun. It's spooky is a masterpiece. Yeah, yep. Like on every level, and so is Merry Christmas is fantastic. All that once again, that's a stress cassette. Yeah, yep. Um, then after artistic vice is fun, rejected unknown, the lucky sperms, somewhat humorous with Jad Fair, uh, fear yourself, lost and found, 
is and always was beam me up with beam and then space ducks. Uh, sound pretty fairly accurate from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question number two, what would you guess is the most played Daniel Johnston song on Spotify? There's no way to know for sure what the most played is because not everything's digital and whatnot, but on Spotify, I can find those numbers. What do you, well, it's, it's from the devil and Dan Johnson. It's either, it's probably true love finds in the end. And if it's not, it's something's last a long time, which the lyrics are written by Jad. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. The very first, uh, the, the top most played song is true love. will find you in the end with 26,765,710 plays on Spotify alone. And then some things. Number three has to, number three has to be devil town. Uh, not on Spotify. What? Walking the cow. Okay. Oh, well, walking the cow is a great, great song. Yep. Um, yep. Those are the top three. Some things last a long time have 9,890,180 plays on Spotify. Um, okay. Well, who could have, who could have predicted that? Right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, which of these bands have never covered a Daniel Johnston song from what I could find? Uh, Bright Eyes, The Flaming Lips, Nirvana, Lana Del Rey. Nirvana never covered Daniel. Very good. Yep. Bright Eyes did. Uh, they did Devil Town. Sparkle Horse and the Flaming Lips did Go. And Lana Del Rey did Some Things Last a Long Time. Hmm. Well, Jeff, I can't even begin to tell you, man, how much of a pleasure it was to meet you and to hang out uh, this evening. I I hope maybe someday you'll come back. So I'm really interested. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know this existed, but um, the real Rocky. I'm really interested in that one. I love uh, boxing. I love that that story. I love the Rocky movies. Um, I grew up loving those. Um, so maybe if you're interested, if you had a good time, we'll talk later, but uh, we'll have you back on to, to do another another. Um, documentary insight after one of those so thank you so much for being here tonight man this has been amazing it's awesome <laughs> uh, thank you for having me I, I appreciate it um i'd be more than happy to after you see the real rocky to do another episode it's all good awesome. and um i do appreciate how much you guys uh, enjoyed the film oh absolutely it was very wonderful and very wonderful to talk to you um if people want to find your stuff uh where can they find you by me or the films? Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> Not that hard to find. You Google me up. Okay. You know, you could probably find an email, but um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Okay. Uh, and the films are all out there. If you Google them up, uh, you know, author the JT, the Roy story, certainly on Amazon Prime. Devil is everywhere. Real Rocky is on Amazon Prime, if you find it under the SPN 30 for 30 series. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Judge presents Tales from a Tour Bus. You can find that on Amazon Prime as well. Cool. Maybe other places. like the, That's animated music docs. Okay. That I, that I work. Um, Half Jap is on... Um, Half Japanese, the band that would be king, is tough to find, but believe it or not, it's on Vimeo. So okay. you could find that on Vimeo. And then The Dude is a short film about the real dude from The Big Lebowski, the Big Lebowski is also yeah. on Vimeo. That's on Vimeo. You can get that one there. Very so cool. that's how you find this film. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening this evening to Talkumentary Insider. Uh, we have been Jeff Kalaski, Bryce Necker, and Jeff Fjurzig. Am I saying that? Am I pronouncing that correctly, Fjurzig? You pronounced it perfectly. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we hope you keep your minds open and be kind to each other. And we will see you on the next episode of Talkumentary. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night, guys. Peace. Thank you again. Yep. <laughs> Thank you.